What's up guys, Mikkel here, and a little bit of a different kind of video today. I wanna to share with you a Twitter space I was on yesterday where John Deaton was speaking because this is an absolutely amazing update of the ongoing Ripple SEC case. This is also one of the few times I feel like John Deaton really does get bullish on his thesis for Ripple winning this thing. Guys, ultimately, this is such a great breakdown of what is going on right now what we can expect going forward, I highly suggest you watch this entire interview through. This is absolutely fantastic. It's only 13 minutes and it's really going to catch you up on everything going on in the Ripple SEC case. I also want to give Crypto Cowboy a shout out for recording this and also quickly let you guys know that we actually have the XRP pennants back in stock right now and you can now actually personalize them with your own text. You can get this in the gold option or the black version as shown right here so guys definitely check this out if you use the code mm in the description of this video there's a link you'll also get 15 percent off so definitely check that out this is definitely a really cool option take it away john well we're uh waiting any day from uh judge uh torres's summary judgment decision all the paperwork is in both sides the sec has asked for summary judgment ripple has asked for summary judgment um, on the 13th. Uh, a lot of people don't believe her decision will become come before June 13th because on June 13th, the infamous Hinman emails and SEC comments that 63 emails, 52 unique drafts of that June 14th, 2018 speech, all of that is going to be unsealed with very limited redactions. Um, She's ruled that way, which implies that, and she said in her order that um, she, the court makes these, declares these judicial documents if they impact her decision making on summary judgment. And so what role those emails are going to play or not play, we know that the CEO, Brad Garlinghouse, has tweeted that it will shock uh, the public. Uh, we know that Stuart, Stuart Alderodi, the general counsel, has said it was well worth the fight of uh, like millions and millions of dollars in litigation. So conventional wisdom at this point is that we won't see the summary judgment ruling until after the 13th of June. You know, which way it's going to go, who knows? I've said someone, I've been someone who said that the SEC may have snatched defeat from the jaws of victory because of the way they charged the case. They could have absolutely, in my opinion, proven that in the early years when, you know, there was the ecosystem, the XRP ledger was only controlled by Ripple and they held all the coins that those initial distributions, sort of just like an ICO of East 2014 ICO, that that, that in fact uh, satisfied the Howey test. But instead, they went with this overarching theme that all sales uh, of XRP, including secondary market sales, uh, regardless of the seller or the circumstances surrounding the sale. In other words, XRP, they said, is an, is represents a security itself. And so um, I believe that the SEC is going to lose on that. That is an absolute unconstitutional expansion of the Howey test. Uh, it stretches Howey beyond any recognition. And a lot of people believe that she'll split the baby and that she'll come up with some early sales that Ripple made, find them for them, uh, and then uh, argue that, you know, rule that uh, today and ongoing and secondary market sales are not. You know, we're all guessing. It's up to Judge Torres, um, so that's where we stand. And, and, and the secondary, John, the secondary John, market sales will be the one... key thing, right, because that's going to be the precedent that's set as to whether other – crypto tokens are or are not security well, yeah, it's the whole reason i got involved and it's why in the library case after the sec law uh, won uh the judge's order could be implied to be uh to be all sales of lbc tokens and in the injunction that the sec was seeking said all persons in interest well that could be every lbc holder so that's why in the penalty phase i went in on behalf of naomi brockwell and said look judge fine you, you ruled against library, not here to argue that, just like I'm not here to argue against, you know, ruling against Ripple, but it is absurd. To, uh, there hasn't been a case in 76 years since Howie where 
an investment contract was held to be a, a security in perpetuity in that in every therefore, every cell thereafter, it's always around the circumstances surrounding the cell. And the judge in library, we don't know yet, but I have a transcript, I can't publish it. He promised that he would make it clear that his ruling was limited to library and direct sales and did not impact the secondary market. Now, there's some people who believe Judge Torres may leave that issue alone, and I'm, I'm confident and hopeful that she won't because that's why I got in as amicus and said, hey, you know, they you do whatever you want against Ripple, but... You know, saying that XRP itself or that secondary market sales are securities is absurd. And and please basically make sure that you clarify that. And the judge in Telegram, her friend, Judge Castell, you know, basically said, look, the Graham itself, even though they were written contracts, Graham initial purchase agreements, those aren't the securities. It's the scheme surrounding the sale and the and all of those things. And so, you know, we'll see. So, John, can I ask a can I ask a basic question? Be, you know, very telling. I, I I believe because the SEC has tried for so many years to to hide the contents of them. So, you know, what is in them that they're trying to hide? I think, you know, whether it's a smoking gun, we don't know. And John, I think we we've, we've talked about this, but you know, there's definitely going to be something in there that brings light into the fact well, of you know kind of why this lawsuit was brought and and why this industry is getting so uh, targeted. Bill, what's your question? Can I ask you guys? Yeah, so. So John, I, I've I've watched these guys since day one. I've known Chris since pretty much day one, and um, this this has gone on before the lawsuit for I, I believe almost seven years in terms of both primary, secondary sales, uh, usage of XRP and then the platform. There was a settlement, I believe, uh, with either Treasury or or uh, DOJ where they had to make code changes. Even I think in the earliest days. So so which is proof uh, positive that that clearly the government was not ignorant of what. Ripple and XRP was all about. How does the judge justify saying, okay, the SEC allowed this to go on for seven years plus before they decided to bring these charges? I mean, that just, that just makes absolutely no sense. No, that's a, that's a, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, and, 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 and why has not, not been brought up and used as, you know, uh, some type of, of defense to say, Hey, look, you know, regardless of what you may think, how could they allow this to go on for seven years if they're so confident in their case? Anyway, and you get the point. No, it's a great it's a great question. And, and I'll take the two things you brought up. What people need to understand, uh, Chris Larson went to the SEC in 2013. The Treasury was there. Federal Reserve was there. Uh, CFTC was there. Chairman of the SEC was there. And he said, I'm introducing to you this decentralized payment system. Two years later, that's when the FinCEN settlement came down, right. and they said, you must apply. These are virtual currency sales. You must apply to the banking laws. The SEC was in a sharing agreement with the FinCEN. They knew then in 2015. 2014, the year before, the United States Government Accountability Office listed XRP as a virtual currency utilized in a decentralized payment payment platform called Ripple. So he, you're 100% right. The, the government knew of this on and on and on for years. And to your second point about seven and a half years of publicly trading, why all of a sudden you bring this lawsuit and you allege this way, that goes to their fair notice defense. And so if the judge feels the way you do and feels the way I do, which is you know holding the SEC accountable you know, for, for their – the way that this all went down, she can rule that even if she finds that there were cells that met the Howey test, that Ripple did not have adequate notice uh, based on all that government, uh, you know, inaction and action uh, that didn't have fair notice. And therefore they have a, a uh, they can win on that. That would be a jury trial. So the a great scenario for Ripple, other than a flat out win, which a lot of people don't think is going to happen, a great scenario for Ripple would be, hey, from 2013 to 2018 or whatever date, uh, let's say before their ODL pro platform, whatever, these meet the Howey test. But based on everything that you just brought up, 
uh, it's going to be a question for the jury whether or not Ripple received fair notice under the law. Uh, and then that would go to jury trial. That's a complete win for Ripple. Uh, at that point, I would never see the SEC going to a jury verdict where jurors are going to hear all of this conduct, plus the stuff that's in those emails. At a minimum, we know that XRP was discussed in those emails. At a minimum, we know that senior people at the SEC advised against giving the speech by simply saying that it's going to create more confusion. You know, why does ETH, you know, and Bitcoin only? What about the third largest? What about these other cryptos? There's going to be all of that dialogue going in there. And so the one thing I should say, I'm very confident Chris and Brad are going to win on the reckless charge. Because in order to prove they aided and abetted Ripple in selling illegal securities, it must meet a recklessness standard, which means it's so obvious to a layperson that XRP was a security. So if these emails and these 52 drafts going back and forth at the SEC in 2018 are, are debating it, if the experts in securities are saying, hey, XRP doesn't look like a security or it doesn't meet all the Howey tests, how could these two individuals know it back in 2013? And so the only other comment I would say is that the SEC wrote a memo now, it's, it's been sealed as privileged, but they wrote an XRP Howey memo on June 13th, 2018. And we don't know what it said, but we know what it didn't say. It there was no recommendation to issue a cease and desist letter to Ripple. So you can bet if the SEC enforcement lawyers said, hey, we've analyzed XRP on June 2018, it is absolutely a security meets the Howey test unequivocally, they would not have not done anything. Instead, they just launched an investigation, you know, that went for two and a half years. So, yeah, I, it, what's, what's interesting it? to me here is that I think there was an impression at the beginning within the crypto community that it was very polarizing. There's a lot of people that actually cheered for Ripple to lose because for whatever reason they hated Ripple. It was a polarizing company. Now I think that to uh, the silver lining is that seemingly everyone has galvanized and come together behind them. Also, of course, with the SEC going after Coinbase, people have, I think, are, are, are largely supporting them. But maybe the silver lining here is that the industry has had enough and they're all coming up behind this uh, to support. But b before you jump in, John, I want to say that was a great summary. Should we even care? This is a question that was I want my, to ask yeah. the panel right that was, now. That was my question. Like, should we yes. even care? Because if Ripple wins, and then that just goes back to the SEC, and the SEC just changes the way that they come after Ripple <laughs> in a separate, right? Uh, so does it even matter? Will it affect the industry? Why is this important? That's what I want to hear people say. And, for so. pro and John as well, I, like, I want to ask exactly that same question, Scott. So, so I'm glad you asked it. What does it mean for projects that are sitting listening to us now, John? Well, the first thing, a great question, the first thing is how many projects can afford $200 million in legal fees? Not many. And, and I've always been hesitant to, like, defend Ripple because I really don't care that much. I, I care about the XRP holders. But let's not forget that there was a two-and-a-half-year investigation, and, and they didn't allege fraud. So I know that Ripple is a very controversial company, but you can bet your ass. I'm a former federal prosecutor. If there was a way to allege – if we're going to sue them anyways – and we can allege fraud on a good faith basis, we would have, and they didn't. And so why should people care? Because we know Coinbase is up on deck. We know there could be a, a case against Binance coming up. This war on crypto is not ending anytime soon. And so uh, this case, as each day progresses, gets bigger and bigger. The, if, if, in fact, Ripple wins, or they, the fair, the judge accepts the fair notice defense. That helps Coinbase because Coinbase was given uh, permission to give an IPO two years ago in 2020, April of 2021. Right? They, they su submitted an S1. They showed the SEC what their business model was. They even went to the SEC in January of 2019 about XRP and said, we're going to list XRP unless you tell us otherwise because we want to go public, you know, and we don't want to run afoul of what you think. And the SEC didn't discourage them.